In this episode, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Jason Fung. Jason is a Canadian nephrologist, a medical doctor who specializes in kidney care and treating diseases of the kidney. He's a world leading expert on intermittent fasting and low carbs, especially for treating people with type 2 diabetes. Jason has written three best selling books The Obesity Code, The Complete Guide to Fasting, and The Diabetes Code. Jason also co founded the Intensive Dietary Management Program and is a leading contributor to dietdoctor.com, a website that features a wealth of information on health. I'm joined by Dr. Jason Fung, who, when I read his book, The Complete Guide to Fasting, was one of the things that turned my life around. Jason, thank you for writing the book, and thank you for being here today. No, thanks for having me on. So, uh, I know you're very busy. You're, uh, you're actually working in hospital today, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I usually, I work full-time in the hospital, so I usually do half a day of office and half a day in the hospital, so... Yeah, how, how and then in between I try and fit in my writing. <laughs> I was going to say, how do you manage to fit in time to write three, well, I, I, and I'm sure there's more to come, but three stunning books. So the Obesity Code is one we promote to so many people here in the UK. Uh, the Complete Guide to Fasting is brilliant. And the Diabetes Code, I mean, they're great, great books. So uh, a big thank you. And also, uh, you're the man behind dietdoctor.com, I believe. Uh, well, I work there. I mean, I mean, I write there. But uh, Andreas Nienfeld, the Swedish uh, family doctor, he's the he's the one who does all the diet doctor stuff. So I'm just a contributor. I write uh, occasionally on that site. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, and tell me about your your day job. I believe you specialize in uh, looking after the kidney. Yeah, so I'm a kidney specialist, and uh, that's mostly what I do. And really, if you look at the causes of kidney disease, the most common cause of kidney disease is of weight loss and diabetes. Uh, you know, if you prevent, if you get people to lose weight, then you can prevent the type 2 diabetes from occurring, which prevents them from developing diabetic kidney disease, which is why I'm so interested in that sort of particular question. Gotcha. And, and is kidney disease mainly due to obesity and diabetes or is that sort of the, the sort of number one problem or are there many factors normally? Um, there's lots of factors, but the number one cause is really kidney disease, uh, is diabetic kidney disease. High blood pressure is another big one. Uh, there's also genetic diseases of inflammation, but they tend to be fairly small contributors. So high blood pressure and, um, and type 2 diabetes are sort of the biggest causes of kidney disease by far. Okay, now I know you're, you, you're, you've got a shocker schedule today, so um, let's dive straight into maybe giving some advice to our listeners. Um, so talk us through, uh, let's talk about the, the book that, that I first got to know you, The Complete Guide to Fasting. Talk us through some of the benefits of intermittent fasting, any concerns, anything we should watch out for, um, who's it for, um, yeah, give, give me your you know, a five minute take on you know, the recommendations on fasting. The, the biggest sort of um, benefits of fasting, the most obvious, are the weight loss, its effects on weight loss and type 2 diabetes. So, uh, both of them are related conditions, but essentially, when you don't eat, you're forcing the body to use up some of its stores of food energy. So the the body can store food energy or calories so that we don't have to eat constantly. So when there's a time that we don't eat, that is when we're fasting, such as overnight. So even when you're sleeping, you're not eating in your sleep. So therefore you have to rely on your body's own uh, sources of stored food calories. The body sort of stores calories in two ways, sugar and fat. So if you have too much fat or if you have too much sugar, then those are conditions that are going to be helped by increasing the amount of fasting that you do. Because when you don't eat, your body's going to have to use up those, the, the body fat or use up the body sugar. And when you do that, the sugar falls, which is good if you're trying to do that better. And if you're trying to lose weight, your body's going to use up some body fat. And everybody always, for some reason, thinks it's such an unnatural thing to do, but that's precisely the reason that we have body fat. 
is so that we have this store of energy. So we're using it for precisely what it was designed to be used for. It's not something unusual and you know weird and stuff. It's been used for thousands of years. It's it's actually the the, the sole purpose of body fat is to act as a store of calories, and it's a very efficient store of calories. So if you have too much, use it. That's all. That's all we're saying. If you're if you're too thin, on the other hand, so if you have uh, malnourishment, if you're underweight, uh, or if nutrition is of very important, like if you're a child or if you're pregnant and so on, yeah, then that may not be the time to do extended fast. But the point is that we are supposed to cycle between feeding when our body is storing calories and fasting when our body is using those calories that we store. So if you maintain a nice balance between the two, feeding and fasting, your weight's going to stay relatively stable. But if all of a sudden you start to only feed and stop the fasting, then you're basically just, you know, the, the calories are going into storage, but they're not coming out. So it's like, it's no wonder that you're going to gain weight over time because you didn't give your body enough time to use the, the, the calories that you've stored. And that's all. It's, it's not something weird, unusual. So if you look at the English language, for example, breakfast, it's the meal that breaks your fast. You can't break a fast if you're not fasting. So it means that the language itself actually, um, you know, acknowledges that you have to be fasting. It's part of a natural based life. Even the French, for example, uh, it also means the same thing uh, to fast, déjeuner, uh, to break a fast. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I when first somebody said to me uh, before I got hold of your book, "Oh, have you tried fasting to lose weight?" Because I was obese for many, many years. I, the, the actual thought of not eating all day, I said, "Well, it's impossible. Nobody could do that." Um, and, and 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 that was because I was always perpetually hungry, probably because I was eating way too many carbohydrates. Um, what, have, what advice have you got for somebody that's going to try it for the first time? Is, it, is, it, is the advice to first of all learn how to sort of cut down the carbs because they seem to always keep you in that state of hunger? Uh, because certainly these days I find that because I don't eat many carbs, I don't even notice the fact that I'm fasting. Yeah, and that's a great point. So if you cut down the carbohydrates, then your body is going to be forced to use uh, fat. So if you're eating a lot of fat, for example, so you're metabolizing fat. And whether your body metabolizes fat from your diet or body fat, it's actually the same thing. So it's a very short step. And the point about hunger is very interesting. So there is usually a transition period when you're getting used to fast. It's about two to three weeks where hunger is going to be an issue and so on. But everybody assumes that when you don't eat, you're going to get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And that's not actually what happens. Uh, and when people start to fast, they actually find that their hunger goes down. And the reason is that during fasting, your body um, isn't sort of like craving calories. It's basically taking uh, the calories from a different source. It's taking it from your body fat. So it's essentially feeding your body through your body fat, which remember is a source of usually hundreds of thousands of calories. The point is that if you are overweight, then you have hundreds of thousands of calories of body fat on your body. So why do you need to eat? The, the reason you need to eat or you get hungry is because your body actually has no access to those calories. So if you're eating constantly, so you take the advice of somebody who's eating low-fat diet, high in carbohydrate, eating six to eight times a day, which unfortunately is quite common and was uh, pretty much an average. Um, if you're eating all the time, your body is not going to be able to use the calories that it's stored because your body, remember when you're eating, insulin goes up and it signals your body to store food calories, it stores food uh, energy. If insulin goes down, it burns it, but you can't do both at the same time. So you can't store calories you can't, and burn calories at the same time. So when you're eating constantly, like throughout the whole day, like a lot of people do, they sort of graze all day. Then their bodies in this sort of store calories mode, which means that they cannot access their body fat. That's not a source of energy that's available to them. So therefore, they get hungry because they run low on fuel. They're like, I need to eat. If you're fasting, you get over that sort of hump, 
then what happens is that your body starts to open the floodgates and you're now you have access to hundreds of thousands of calories of body fat and you feed on it. So your hunger actually starts to go down. So it's a very interesting thing because fasting actually does the exact opposite for hunger that most people expect it to do. So people expect to be more hungry when you're doing fasting. In fact, most people find that they're less hungry. People come back to our clinic and we've treated thousands of people and they go, ah, I think my stomach shrank. I can't <laughs> eat that much anymore. And it's yeah. like, it's true. Yeah. Because you have access to those big stores of body fat. So you don't need to eat so much and your body is actually telling you. But now you're trying to lose weight with your body instead of against your body because the old way of just counting your calories, grazing, low carb, uh, you know, low fat, it, your people were always hungry and then they couldn't mm. stick to their, um, you know, their, their weight loss because they're always hungry. And hunger is a very, very potent stimulant. It's one of the sort of most basic urges of, of humanity. So it's very interesting. The same thing, uh, you know, people think that, hey, if your stomach is empty, you're going to be hungry. It's like, that's not true. Hunger is determined by the hormones because it's not just the state of your stomach. Because if you think about the circadian rhythm, you can, you can look at studies where people, they just look at people and say, when are you least hungry and when are you most hungry? If you take an average, the, the time of day that people are the least hungry is 8 a.m. And the time of day that people are the most hungry is 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. And if you think about 8 a.m., that is also the time of the day where you have gone the longest without food. So you've gone, say, 12 hours. If you ate dinner sort of 8 p.m. the day previous, you've gone 12 hours without eating, and yet you're the least hungry on average. That is the least hungry period of the day. And at 8 p.m., you just ate sort of a few hours ago, and yet you're <laughs> hungry. It's like, why yeah. is that? Well, it's because it's controlled by your hormones, not by if there's food in your stomach or when you last ate. So that's that's a few things about hunger which are very important because for people who are always battling hunger as the big as a big thing, the fasting actually presents a very unique um, opportunity to try something that might be successful for them. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That I hadn't thought about it looking at the body clock and the cycle before, and that's that's a really interesting point. And the other point, of course, is that so many people say. Well, that can't be right because breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but we're starting to learn that's quite nonsense. Um, uh, what, what's your view yeah. on people that keep promoting that? You know, uh, maybe it's the cereal companies behind it all, but <laughs> why are so many people still saying you mustn't skip breakfast, it's the most important meal of the day? Why, why are we still... You know, I think it's breakfast? because there's, there's a certain truth to it, but it's not really the whole truth. So... Um, one, breakfast is the meal that breaks your fast. So you can break your fast at noon as easily as you can break it at 7 a.m. So it's, in, in a sense, you know, eating early in the day is not something that is necessary. Uh, people always say, well, you need to have energy for the day ahead. And it's like, no, you don't, because your body's already done that for you. So people always say, well, you know, I have a full day, I need to eat something. Well, what, what, do you, what do you think all those hundreds of thousands of calories that are sitting in your body fat? You think your body's just ignoring it? No. So every day at around 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., your body undergoes a certain change, and it's part of the circadian rhythm, and certain hormones go up. And those hormones are called the counter-regulatory hormones, and they're things like cortisol and noradrenaline and uh, growth hormone. And anyway, what they do is they take the glucose that you've stored in your body and they push it out into your blood. So your body's already fueling you up for the day. Your body's done it already. There's no need to put a muff muffin in your mouth at 7 a.m. <laughs> like you can work normally without yeah. it. Yeah. So that whole idea that you have to eat first thing in the day is completely false. Um, uh, you know, if, uh, the other grain of truth is that if you eat early in the day versus late in the day, so if you eat for, you know, eight hours of the day or six hours of the day, and you look at the insulin effect. So insulin is the, the hormone that tells you to store body fat as opposed to using it. You actually get much more of an effect late at night. So for the same, you can take the same meal, exact same meal, eat it at 8 a.m. versus 8 p.m. 
And the hormonal response will actually be different. So you'll get a much bigger uh, insulin spike at 8 p.m. So therefore, uh, there is a little bit of truth that eating earlier in the day is important. But that's assuming that you have the same duration of eating. So if you eat uh, for eight hours a day, yes, it's better to eat it er uh, up front and not eat late at night. Mm -hmm. But it's not better to take breakfast and then keep eating until late at night. Like that's extending the duration of your uh, eating window. So it, it gets it gets a little technical in there, but the, this whole idea of breakfast being the most important thing, it's not really borne out. Most of the studies that show this are actually uh, uh, sponsored by cereal companies and so on that are trying to feed you breakfast. And, and truthfully, uh, you know, in, in uh, lots of places, Italy and France, tons of people just have a coffee and espresso first thing yeah. in the morning. And they're obviously much less uh, have much less weight problems than the UK and the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that when I read your book, it was very early on for me in terms of, you know, changing my life around and, and losing the weight. And it was the first time I'd read, because again, one of the, the big myths out there is that, well, you know, if you, if you keep skipping meals, you'll slow down your metabolism. But you wrote that actually, certainly up to day three or day four, your metabolism, the, the, while you're fasting, actually speeds up rather than slows down. Uh, and I've certainly found you know, that to be the truth uh, for me. Explain why that is and, and, and how, again, that's a big myth. Yeah, so this is one of the other, the other really big myth of fasting is that um, if you look at low-calorie diets, so if you eat sort of 500, you can cut 500 or 600 calories out of your um, meal every day. So you know, that's the standard advice. Just cut 500 calories a day or just a pound a week. Uh, it doesn't ever actually work because what happens is that your metabolic rate simply slows down by about five or 600 calories. So you're eating 500 less, but you're burning 500 less. So therefore you're not losing weight. So even though people think that basal metabolic rate stays stable, it actually doesn't. It can go up or down by 40, 50%. The reason that fasting goes better is that when insulin goes down, so when you don't eat insulin, it goes down, but other hormones go up. So these are the counter-regulatory hormones. So what happens is that if you are, uh, uh, you know, looking at the uh, activation of the body, one of the things that happens when insulin goes down is that sympathetic nervous system goes up. So that's your fight or flight response. And our adrenaline goes up, cortisol goes up, growth hormone goes up. And those all tend to maintain your metabolic rate. So therefore, if you look, for example, at a study of uh, four days of fasting, and you measure how many calories they're burning on day zero versus day four, it actually goes up by about 10%. And there's also studies of alternate daily fasting where they look and compare that directly to simply a, a chronic calorie restriction. And what they find is that the, uh, there's a much uh, better uh, maintenance of your metabolic rate. It's because your body isn't, isn't taking less fuel. In. It's changing fuel sources. So you're changing from, from food to the body fat. And then the body's like, whoa, I have tons of this body fat. So why do I need to slow down my metabolism? Because if you're burning 2,000 calories, you want to keep burning 2,000 calories. But if you don't have access to those stores of body fat because you're constantly eating, right? You can't store calories and burn that at the same time. Then you have to, because if you are eating all the time and you can't access that body fat, therefore, instead of getting 2,000 calories a day, you're only getting 1,500 a day. You can only burn 1,500 a day because you have no other source of calories. As opposed to fasting where you go to zero calories coming in from your food. Your body now switches to burning fat, body fat. And you go, oh, I have like 400,000 calories of body fat. <laughs> so I'm going to take 2,000 out today, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's as simple as that, right? It's like a bank. So if you have access to your bank account, you can take out that money. But the problem yeah. is if you don't have access to that bank account, you can only spend what's coming in. And that's the big difference is that the switching of the fuel sources and allowing your body to access the stored calories that's the sort of crucial difference that everybody always sort of you know when you talk about calories in calories out it's, it's a real minefield because it's it's a totally the science there's complete it's it's very simplistic and it's very stupid actually 
Yeah. Uh, because people, people don't look at it from a physiologic standpoint. They, they look at it, oh, it's like, a, you know, your calorie, uh, you know, if you take a few extra calories, your body will dump it into fat stores. Well, why couldn't it burn a few yeah. extra calories, right? And, and it perfectly could. But what tells your body to store it or to, to, to burn it is the hormones that, that are being activated or not activated. And, and fasting is just a way to sort of fix this hormonal problem of too much insulin by lowering insulin and allowing you to use that body fat. That's brilliant. You know, I've never thought about it, and I've written a few books myself. I'd never thought about it that way before. So you're restricting the calories in because that's what a normal diet does. And therefore, less calories in means we just, in you know, the body, you know, it looks in for homeostasis, it's trying to regulate itself. So you come down by 500 calories a day, you think, hey, I'm doing great here, but you just spend less calories, your metabolism slows down. But then you switch yeah. to fasting, and then all of a sudden the body goes, well, I'm not starving, I've got access to as many calories as I want, well, I'll keep my metabolism as high as I want to keep it. Exactly, and this is why people think that fasting causes your metabolic rate to go down. Because they say, hey, when I go down 500 calories, my metabolic rate goes down 500 calories. If I went to zero, I'm going to go way down. And it's not true. So they've done studies on the Biggest Loser contestants, for example, which is an American uh, reality show where people compete to lose weight. And when they do these sort of calorie-restricted diets, every single one of them, their metabolic rate just plummets, like plummets. Well, fascinating. Fascinating. Well, thank, thanks for that. You've you said it in such a clear way that, that, that really answers that question. So we've done quite a bit on uh, fasting. You've kind of touched on diabetes and insulin. Uh, give us uh, some extracts from your obesity code and, and, and what we can learn uh, from the obesity code, which, of course, all these are interlinked massively, but uh, any sort of quick outtakes from the obesity code? Yeah, the, the whole point of the obesity code, so they all cover sort of different aspects because it's really too much to go over all in one part. But the obesity code is really a book about science. It's not about fasting specifically. It's about the science of weight loss and weight gain because everybody thinks it's all about calories. So the whole, uh, the whole field is based on, you know, of obesity medicine is based on calories and calories out. But the whole idea is actually not very smart because – the, the point is, if you look at calories in, calories out, this is the sort of energy balance equation. So fat gain equals calories in, not calories out. That, that's always true, but it's not useful in any way. And it's, it's like saying, you know, it's, it's sort of like first order thinking, right? It's like, oh, you get rich if there's more money coming out in than going out. Well, it's like, yeah, that's true, but it's not useful in any way. Um, and it's like, okay, so if you take the case of money, you say, okay, well, if you get rich, if more money is coming in. So therefore, the simple solution is to have more money coming in than going out. Hey, I just solved world poverty, everybody. Good job. Good job, everybody. It's like, that's stupid because it's like, okay, well, how are you going to get the money in and money out? Same thing with the calories. So why are people having more calories in than yeah. calories out? That's the real question. Mm -hmm. And that's the answer that if you do pass calories in calories out people, they say, well, it's, it's a choice. It's like, so people chose to eat more calories all of a sudden in 1977. So prior to that, there's no, there's very little obesity for hundreds of years. And, and there's no widespread famine, like other than outside the world wars, for example, by the 1970s, there's decades of, you know, there's not that many people starving in the United States. In 1970, for example. Mm -hmm. So why would people all of a sudden decide that they're going to eat more calories in 1977? Like, did something change? And yes, the, it was the, the change in our diet. So it was this change from eating a regular sort of everything, mm -hmm. each, and to eating lots of carbs. That's what we were told. Eat less fat, eat more carbs. That was the specific guidelines that came out of the dietary guidelines for America. So there is a huge, huge, huge dietary change. And, um, you know, as a result of that, people ate more calories. So, but you have to see why. So it's because, of course, insulin is spiking up, which is telling your body to store all these calories. As you store those calories, you have no access to those calories, right? So suppose you're eating 2,000 calories. 
and you go from a high fat diet to a low fat diet, which was this change that we did in 1977. So you go from a high fat to a low fat, and you're eating more carbs, and suppose you're eating the same number of calories. Well, insulin goes way up if you're eating a lot of carbs, and not so way up if you're not. So you're eating more carbs, so insulin's going higher. So you're storing more of those calories as fat. So if you're storing more of it as fat, you have no energy. So you're going to go out and eat more because mm -hmm. you want to make up that stuff that just went into the storage. So it's, 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 it's like obvious why your body wants to eat more because you're storing it away. It's not, it's not accessible to yeah. the body. But that's because you change your diet from high fat to low fat diet. And that's the whole idea of uh, looking at the hormonal response of obesity. And that's really what, um, you know, the obesity code is all about, is trying to understand that it's really the hormones that tell our body to gain weight and not simply the calories. So the biggest driver of calories in is not personal choice. It's hunger. That's what you have to control if yes. you really want to make a dent in it. And for calories out, it's not exercise. It's your basal metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. If you're locking away all your energy, well, your metabolic rate has to slow because you don't have access to energy. Sure. Right? It's, it's, that's the whole point is that it's all determined by hormones and not the calories you eat or don't eat. Because you can fight it for a while. So you can reduce your calories in for a while. Um, you'll lose some weight. But then your body will fight back. So it'll make yourself more hungry, and we know that, or it will slow down your metabolic rate. We know that too. And that's going to work directly against you. So essentially what's happening is that, think about it this way. If you have a thermostat in your house and uh, you, know, you set it for room temperature and then you, you, know, you, you think it's too hot, then the air conditioning comes down to, and, and normally it controls it at a very set temperature. Well, if you want to try and lower the temperature, you need to change the thermostat. Instead, if what you do is you take it, you know, buy a bunch of air conditioners, you know, cool down the house, the, the, the thermometer, the, the thermostat is going to detect that the room is cooler and it's going to turn on the heat, right? And you're in this constant battle. Same thing with your body. If you simply change the calories, well, your body's going to say, well, you've changed the calories, but you haven't changed the hormonal hyperinsulinemia. Yeah. So therefore, I'm going to make you hungry. I'm going mm -hmm. to make you eat more. And if you deliberately stop yourself from eating, which is possible, then I'm going to drop your metabolic rate. So it's like, okay, well, how is that going to work in the long term? It's the same thing as your, you know, instead of adjusting the thermostat and fixing the hormones, mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're trying to fight it, fight your body the whole time. And this is what we've told people is the correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's the whole problem is that it doesn't work. If it worked, I'd be fine with it, but it doesn't yeah. work. So that's why you have to understand what's happening. And that's what the obesity code is about. So fasting comes in at the very last chapter, and it's just the last uh, part about how to fix this hormonal change. Oh. And then the complete oh. guide to fasting is more of a practical yeah, and what you talked in there about was what you have to do. You you explained it brilliantly. You were saying that that you know we put on weight, a couple of pound kilo every year. You know, some people faster, of course, but you know weight overall comes on gradually, and that certainly happened to me. I didn't become obese overnight. It slowly went up and slowly went up. In other words, the thermostat just slowly started to rise, and and the only way to bring that thermostat back down isn't just to keep fighting, like you say, putting more air conditioning in, is to actually reset the hormones, reset the thermostat. And the only way to really reset it is, is with that intermittent fasting and completely changing the diet, isn't it, to, to um, really move, yeah, really reduce those carbohydrates. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the main thing. Yeah, the carbohydrates is the main thing. But you have to remember, too, that in the 1970s, people are fasting. 14 hours a day, every day without thinking about it. So mm. six o'clock is dinner because I yeah. grew up in the seventies, right? Six o'clock was dinner. People tend to eat dinner earlier because the mother stayed home probably. So it's six o'clock dinner and eight o'clock breakfast. That's a 14 hour fasting day for virtually like everybody I knew every day of the year practically without people even thinking about their fasting. Right mm -hmm. now it's like you go two hours without fasting and people think that's, uh, you know, some kind of hardship. 
So the point is that not only were they eating sort of normal foods, they were also incorporating that natural fasting period. Where mm. we went wrong, I think, was that when we went to, uh, you know, from eating bacon and eggs to toast with jam, is that that toast with jam, without, with, it's highly refined. It doesn't keep you full. The insulin, the sugar spikes up, the insulin spikes up, and then it spikes down. By 1030, you're ravenous and looking for some low-fat muffins. Right? So now you're eating sort of all the time because the foods that you're eating aren't keeping you full. So you're eating mid-morning snack, you're eating an afternoon snack, you're eating a bedtime snack. Now you're eating six times a day. But then people were like, hey, I'm eating six times a day, which is completely out of line with what we used to do. Mm -hmm. But because I'm eating low fat, that must be the correct thing to do. And therefore, yeah. that's where this whole, oh, you should eat six times a day. Because <laughs> in that flowed from the whole low fat advice, which we know is completely wrong now, right? We've, we've totally backtracked on that whole fat thing. Like nobody really thinks, that, you know, that eating a low fat diet is all that good for you these days. But, you know, that, that was where it came along. So not only did you change the foods, but because you changed the foods, you changed the food frequency. Mm -hmm. Now we're really screwed because we changed the two things that were sort of keeping us in mind. And it gets even worse. Certainly in Great Britain, I'm not sure what you have in America. We have now the ability to sit at home and have a Deliveroo or Just Eat bring us any takeaway food we want to our home at any time of the day. So what, what I've even seen it in my own children, I've had to really <laughs> keep a watchful eye on it because, you know, if they eat the wrong food before I get home, uh, so they think they've had their tea, but then they get hungry. And before I know it, they're on the internet having something delivered at 10 o'clock at night, which is, again, almost junk food. And then you're cutting down that fasting period. Like you say, back in the 70s, you'd eat up to 6 o'clock at night, but you'd eat a good meal. Therefore, you're not hungry later in the evening. You go to bed, you get up in the morning, you've had a big fasting period. So, yeah, it's all gone horribly, horribly wrong. And it must be really... Uh, you know, my, my new book, as you know, is, is, is Fat and Furious, because I'm furious about all this misinformation. But as somebody that looks at... You know, people coming into the hospital with, with kidney problems, knowing that a lot of that is driven by obesity and diabetes. And that is just because we've changed, as you quite rightly say, not just what we eat, but the frequency is too frequent now. That must really make you furious. Yeah, because people don't know and they get blamed for it. So the people yeah. who are overweight, they, 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 people look at them and say, well, you know, you let yourself go. or Oh, you brought it on yourself. And it's like, no. You know, in America, you've got something like 60 or 70 percent people being overweight or obese. And it's like, no, like a couple hundred million Americans didn't just decide that they wanted to be obese. Like that didn't happen. Yeah. It's because there is this huge change. But it, it, it can only happen if it's sort of a um, sort of government mandated change. Like people won't be like that unless we've been told to do that because it's too widespread. And therefore, those policies, uh, what, 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 what has failed is the dietary policies and nobody really having the guts to say, look, this is all wrong. And it's yeah. like, it's not my opinion that it's all wrong. Look yeah. at the obesity stats. Yeah. Something we've done is completely idiotic. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but somebody has to figure it out. Instead, the academics you know, in the universities and stuff, they never do stuff. They never say, oh, you know what? It's all wrong. We need to change of course 180. Fat is not bad. Fat is actually pretty good. Or, oh, you shouldn't eat six times a day. You should eat two times a day. Like they yeah. don't want to change because then they have to admit they're wrong. They'd have to say, look, that stuff I told you about eating margarine, it's all wrong. Nobody ever says that, right? I don't mind saying it because I wasn't the one <laughs> put it out there. But it's like, you have to at some point say, look, that advice to eat margarine, it's all wrong. That, eat, that advice to eat lots of carbs, it's all wrong. We were totally wrong and we need to change that. Uh, but, you know, they like to save face. So they, they make these gradual changes and there's tons of debate and there's still lots of people who say sugar is fine, right? There's, there's a lot of uh, people who say it's all about the calories, it's not about the sugar. And, you know, that's of course changing too, the sugar obviously always was part of a huge part of obesity but you know when this whole calories thing took off everybody says well you know if, if you eat 100 calories of candy and 100 calories of broccoli it, it's the same fattening effect it's like <laughs> you better be an idiot to think that right? it's like who thinks that like if if you told your grandmother that 
She yeah. think you're like the dumbest person ever. It's like, don't tell me you can eat candy for dinner because yeah. it's stupid. Okay. It's stupid. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, you don't have people who say stuff like that anymore. And it's like, well, you have to, because otherwise people get the wrong idea that you can eat ice cream for dinner and you'll be perfectly fine. It's like, you won't. If you yeah. eat salmon for dinner and equal calorie portion of ice cream instead, you will get fat eating ice cream for dinner. I guarantee. Yeah. Look, Jason, I know you've got to get back to the hospital. It's been absolutely fabulous to talk to you. You've raised and, and eloquently put across, certainly on the fasting, in a beautiful way that I've not heard before. So thank you for that. Uh, and I know you've got to rush back to the hospital, but I always end with two questions. Uh, so if, if I can, first one is give me, Dr. Jason Fung's five tips for living healthier and happier for longer, please. Um, I think there's, there's a few. I mean, um, and they're not all dietary. Obviously, you want to eat real food. So uh, mm -hmm. rather than focusing on sort of like, oh, how many percent carb or percent protein, it's like just eat real foods. So not processed foods. And, and the thing about a lot of the wheat uh, products like bread and so on is that it's highly processed. So you take a wheat berry and it's highly processed. So you take stuff as close to sort of natural state. Because even if it's a carbohydrate, even if it's beans or something, Yep. If it's close to its natural state, our bodies are pretty well evolved to eat it. Mm -hmm. So don't eat margarine because margarine is not a natural product. Eat butter. So eat natural foods. That's probably, you know, from a dietary standpoint. Great one. one thing. Number two is don't eat all the time. And that's yep. the same thing with fasting. So you don't necessarily have to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, but you do have to uh, have some kind of fasting period in every day. Yep. That's the time you're going to use up the stores that the, the calories that you've burned. Uh, three is, um, you know, there's a lot of other things that go on with longevity that are really uh, sort of underappreciated because they're hard to study. One of them is a sense of community or mm -hmm. purpose. And that's, you know, anytime you look at, um, you know, people who live long time, it's because they have a purpose yep. in their life. Um, or a community that they enjoy being around. So whether it's taking care of your grandkids or great grandkids or whatever, it's a, it's, it's a purpose uh, there. And um, it's, it's one of these things that is just so hard to study, but it's, it's actually, I think, much more important than, uh, you know, almost everything else. It's, it's you know, belonging yeah. to, a, to, a, to a group of people, uh, having responsibilities, even as you get older and so on. So that's, that's you know, very important. Staying active is very important. So, again, yeah. you know, I don't think anybody quite would disagree with that. There's really not mm -hmm. too much uh, to disagree with. Um, you know, and, and that's that's probably the, the main thing. I mean, the... So the eat, real, eat real foods. Don't have to be so paranoid like I probably am about... Uh, avoid this, avoid that, but eat as long as he hasn't got a label on it and it's real and we've always eaten it as humans, carry on eating that, have periods where you're not eating, try and stay socially active. So, you know, meet people, go out for dinner with people, spend time with your loved ones. So try and keep a group of close people around you, intimate relationships. Uh, and, and then of course, exercise. But great advice. Really, really great advice. And the final one I, I ask everybody, um, uh, what would you like your legacy to be? Um, I think my legacy is, you know, I'd really, and I've actually always thought this, it's like, is to really get rid of type 2 diabetes and obesity because mm -hmm. it's a huge burden on people. And yep. what people don't recognize, so if you take type 2 diabetes, it's really your blood sugar, your body, there's too much sugar in your body. So if you just don't eat, your body will use it up. So now you can naturally reverse type 2 diabetes. But mm -hmm. it doesn't take money. It doesn't take surgery. It doesn't take medications. It only takes the right knowledge yep. so if you have that knowledge that you can fast and you can change your diet and you can get rid of your type 2 diabetes yeah that's all we're trying to do we only have to spread knowledge not come up with you know 10 quadrillion dollars to change the nhs or change medicare or whatever right we don't need to do that we just need to tell people and they don't they can do it themselves they don't need their doctor they don't need their pharmacist they don't need anybody 
right? And yeah, this is advice absolutely. that they used to get from their grandmother. Yeah. Um, so this is the whole thing that I really, that's what, that's what the whole journey for me has been about. Well, you thank know, you very much for taking the time that. today because well, hopefully the, the, our podcast will get plenty of viewers and uh, hopefully that you know, will in a small way help sort of work towards your legacy because I think what we've learned for you today has been absolutely fascinating. So, uh, again, thank you for taking the time out and uh, uh, it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.